Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Ao. Leadership is harder than it looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into the great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Dr. Sandhya Suriram is the CEO and co-founder of Shilk Meats, a cell-based clean meat company in Singapore. Their mission is to bring delicious, clean, and healthy seafood and meats by harvesting from cells instead of animals. Shook Meats brings cell-based crustacean meats like shrimp, crab, and lobster to your table. They have been featured by The Economist, Routers, Forbes, World Economic Forum, TechCrunch, Channel News Asia, Tech in Asia, and Nas Daily. Their investors include Y Combinator, Big Idea Ventures, Entrepreneur First, Monday Nissan, Lionheart Ventures, ERA VC, Beyond Impact, and Boom Capital. Dr. Sandhya is also the director and founder of Cyglo, an ed tech and event management company that serves as a one-stop solution for scientists and students globally. She is also the co-founder of Biotech in Asia, a virtual newsroom that covers simplified and curated research and insights for all stakeholders in the biotech and healthcare ecosystem. She had previously worked as the Senior Program and Business Development Manager and a Senior Research Fellow for the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, commonly known as ASTAR. Dr. Sandhya earned her PhD in Biological Sciences at the Nanyang Technological University. Her thesis from NTU explored the role of myostatin in oxidative stress in skeletal muscle. She also graduated with first-class honors twice from the University of Madras with a master's degree in biotechnology and a bachelor's degree in microbiology. Her work has been featured on Forbes Women in Tech and TEDx conferences. In her free time, she writes blog posts for Nature Biotechnology and produces influencer content at Morgue. You can follow her at www.linkedin.com slash IN slash Sandhya Suriram. Hey, Sandhya, so good to have you on the show. Hi, Jeremy, nice to be here and thank you for inviting me. Everyone's always so amazed by your team's journey, really building out Singapore's alternative protein as a leader, not just in the region, but also globally. I still remember the time when I was flipping through economists and I saw them mentioning show meats and I had to message you and say, hey, just saw your startup make it to the big times. And it was cool to see you know, all the progress you've made from stage to stage. Yeah, thank you. It's been a roller coaster ride, I think. Every startup is, but when you're running a deep tech startup in one part of the world where you're the first to ever do it, it's like roller coaster 10 times. <laughs> and it's a journey that's exhilarating, at the same time, very scary. I'm very honest about it. I mean, I've done a couple of startups before this, but this has been one of the toughest, but at the same time, the most exciting, I would say. So it's pretty good. The press and media have been very kind to us. <laughs> We've been getting a lot of good press, which is great. We like to do that because it actually encourages consumer education more than anything. It is a novel field that we're working on and we're working on food and everybody likes to eat. So we need to talk about it a bit more to make them understand why alternative protein is required, why shiok meats is required, and why we need to start thinking about food a different way. Amazing. Can't wait to dive into the gritty reality of operational life versus the gloss of the external media love, right? For those who don't, haven't had a chance to know you yet, could you share what your journey has been from your perspective? Sure. So currently, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Shiok Meats, which is a cell-based seafood company. So we work on crustacean meat, which is meat from shrimp, crab, lobster, but we make it using stem cells instead of animals. So it's ethical, cruelty-free, no antibiotics, so better for health, good for animals because we don't kill them, good for the environment because we use lesser energy, lesser resources, and also is sustainable in the sense because we don't have enough seafood left in the ocean for us to consume. 
So why I mentioned that first is you can see it's a mix of food with biotech, with business, with consumer education and all of it. So I would say the past 35 years of me being on this planet Earth has kind of culminated onto one thing that I'm very passionate about, which is food and science. So my background is I have been a stem cell scientist for about 10 years of my life, starting from undergrad to master's to PhD to postdoc. So worked with stem cells throughout, and I love stem cells, was a scientist always in my head, in my body, in my soul. But around 2014, I started up a blog with a couple of my postdoc friends where we started writing science in simple English for everybody to understand because we felt that mainstream media was sensationalizing science too much and people were getting a bit confused. Like simple things like this drug cures cancer, but if it does cure, why are people still dying from that cancer? But the the study was probably done in a mouse or in a monkey and not in humans yet, but the sensationalized title says that it's already cured cancer, but it's not in humans. So we started writing titles like cure for cancer in mice (laughs) and not in humans yet or something like that. So started up as a blog, which ended up becoming my first entrepreneurial venture It became a science news website and an actual business that made money and generated revenue. And that was kind of a deep throw into something that I had never imagined that I would do in my life. Like I mentioned, I was always a scientist, wanted to do research throughout my life. My dream was to be a professor at a university, have my own lab, my own students and postdocs and so on. But I think the first step into entrepreneurship via biotech in Asia, which was the first business, threw me out. One thing that I realized that was I actually enjoyed it. I never knew that I had that acumen in me and that trait in me where I could go and sell a business to people outside. I could do a lot of talking because as a scientist, I was such an introvert, always like to be in the lab. With biotech in Asia, I found out another side of me that I enjoyed. It was still with the science. I think science will never leave what I do. It it is a part of my life from day one. And that was kind of my first step into entrepreneurship, which made me think about what I want to do for the rest of my life. So that's when also I quit being a scientist and took a huge leap and ended up taking up business development in a scientific research institute. I basically went to my previous director and I told him what I don't enjoy research anymore. I want to learn the business of science. Can you take a risk with me? Give me a job for a year. I want to understand finance, budgeting, IP, commercialization, patents, all of the other not fancy things of science. And I want to do that. And he actually gave me the chance. And I'm very thankful for him doing that. I loved it. I enjoyed it. I ended up doing that for about three years before quitting that as well. And in 2018, coming up with a full on confidence that I can start up a deep tech biotech company on my own. And that's when She of Meets was born. Amazing. Take us back to that room. How did you feel when you finally left the scientific world? What was it like to take the plunge? Were you already working on some ideas on the side? Did you join a program? How are you feeling and what were you doing during that time? I think really good question. I mean, there are two phases to this. So one phase is when I quit being a scientist, but was still a business manager in a scientific institute. I think that was a revelation of its own. I realized that there's so much to the other side of science that a lot of us don't know about. We all knew about the actual lab work, the results, the publications, but what about converting one of these lab products into an actual product? that you can sell to a consumer. That was what I was doing. I was trying to take academic research out of the lab and push it into a hospital or a clinic or the industry to actually make it a product. And I found out that less than 1% of the science actually made it down that line, which was shocking because multi-billion dollars go into this industry. I just couldn't settle with it. And I had a feeling that I have to quit healthcare slowly. I need to go into something where in my lifetime, I can see the product with the research that I do or my colleagues do or so on. So that was first phase. But I stuck on to doing that for three years because I really wanted to. It was like an MBA on a job, literally. Instead of getting a degree, I actually got real life experience and it made perfect sense to me. But in 2018, I was equipped with all of this knowledge. And by then, I was four years into learning about cell-based needs. 
I came across the first time when I was running Biotech in Asia, which was my first company. And I was very intrigued by using stem cells for meat and seafood. So I have been a vegetarian all my life because of ethical and religious and cultural reasons and so on. But I've seen many people eat meat and seafood and they enjoy it. But whenever I go back and ask them a question, do you feel guilty about it? All of them have at least a small percentage of guilt. But I realize that you cannot convert everyone to become vegans and vegetarians. That's just not going to work. And it's going to tip the scales for the earth as well in terms of environment. So we just had to find a solution where people can still enjoy seafood and meats, but without harming animals, the environment and themselves. So I think cell-based meats kind of ticked all the boxes for me. And I was obsessively reading about it for four years before 2018. And then around June 2018, I decided to quit my full-time job. I joined Entrepreneur First, the founder program, like an accelerator. I got selected for it, but within a couple of weeks before joining the program, I was contemplating what I wanted to do as part of EF, like what I wanted to work on. I definitely knew I wanted to start a stem cell related company. I definitely knew I want to be the founder, but I definitely also knew that I don't want to be the scientist on the team. I wanted to be the business person. So that was the mindset that I went into EF with. And somewhere along the line during EF, I realized that Shiok Meats is what I want to do. Start a cell-based meat and seafood company in Singapore, in Asia, catering to the Asian population. And that's exactly what I did. And I think it's the best choice of my life that I've made, honestly. Amazing journey. Across your career, what have you learned about leadership? I think I've definitely learned how not to be a bad leader. <laughs> I mean, I would say, <laughs> can I just say that I've had really bad bosses? I've had really good bosses as well, but I have seen the worst of it all. Honestly, at least for me, it was the worst. And I think through that, I've learned what not to do as a leader or as a boss. I'm glad that you use the term leader rather than boss or employer, because that's exactly what I am in Shiok and I what what I intend to be. I think everybody who joins Shiok owns a part of the company in some way or the other. And it's just having a leader to kind of show them the direction, a sense of milestone and goal and leading them towards that. That's exactly what a leader does. And that's exactly what I want to do. My idea of being a leader is pass on all the knowledge and the skill that you've learned over and over again to someone else so that they can kind of imbibe it and that way they can pass on that skill to someone else in the future. So it's all about delegation. It's all about not having a sense of ownership of doing certain things, like not holding on to it and said, I did it. That I should never come. A leader always says, we as a team did it. We as a company did it. At the end of the day, it's the product and the company that shines. The team behind it is a collective push rather than one person or two people. So. I've definitely learned what not to do. I've definitely learned that a certain percentage of freedom is required for all your employees. They have to have the ownership, but that comes with you kind of letting them be rather than asking them to stick to certain timings or certain rules and regulations within the company and so on. Of course, discipline is important, but you have to draw a thin line between freedom and I don't want to run a company where I have robots. I have robots for that. I need people who think out of the box, who are very excited to come in every day. And I, I always tell this to my employees. I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. I, for me, it's a good thing. But I always tell them, the minute you wake up one morning and you're like, oh, do I have to go, go to work today? Oh, no, it's so boring. And the minute you feel that, please quit your job and find another one. And that's exactly what I did throughout my career. The minute I felt that, oh my God, do I have to get up today? Do I have to go? Do I have to see that person? Is the time I started looking for my other job. So people come and go. You can't have your employees for the entire span of the company. I wish I could, but people you know, want to grow differently. They want to try different things. So the minute you're unhappy with your job is when you have to move on. And I think that sums up my leadership of sorts to an extent. Amazing set of insights there. You've really seen a lot and there were good times and there must have been bad times. You know, what hurdles have you, you know, overcome along the way? 
So I would kind of pick up three main hurdles, I think. For me, I think personally, the first hurdle is more personal, like in my head kind of a thing, was can I quit being a scientist and start taking up more of a leadership business role in the sciences? I think it's like getting on a roller coaster, but 10 times the ride and going on the loop for a continuous 10 minutes, just imagine. A roller coaster is generally 30 seconds to a minute. So going through that and going through that over and over and over again for years to come. Was I ready for that? Will my family be ready for that? Will they be able to support me? I have a kid, I have a husband. All of these were there. And also the fear of failure, right? I think all of us fear failure to an extent. Yes, you fail and you learn a lot, but the fear of failure is always there. So I'm like, what if I get into the business, start a company and it does well. But what if I fail as a leader, as a CEO, as a co-founder, but the company does well, but still the limelight will be on me saying that she failed that kind of a thing. So I think that sense of being scared, but at the same time, having the confidence, but still being scared, I think it's a very good mix. And after I spoke to a lot of entrepreneurs, all of us are kind of on the same boat, I would say. It's a scary journey, but all of us have this vision and this mission that we want to head towards. And I think that trumps the scary part. So that was one thing. That was one challenge. But I think my husband's been my best friend all my life. I've known him for many, many years. I met him when I was in school. So he's always my sounding board. Always go back to him and throw it at him. And I'm like, what do you think? (laughs) And then he comes back saying, if you don't try, you'll never know. So just go ahead and try it. So literally that was my personal hurdle of sorts. The second was, I think, starting Shio. We started off and then the next, of course, every hurdle for every deep tech company is funding. So we started up in Singapore, which is the other side of the world from Silicon Valley, where most of the investors and money and most of the cell-based meat companies were. So we were starting in a very different geographical location, two female scientist founders who quit their daytime, well-paid daytime jobs two Asians who did that. And I think it was so out of the blue. People were like, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? You were in a great job. Why are you doing this? You're ending your life and your career. We had a lot of very supportive angel investors, but not a lot of the Asian investors wanted to take a risk on us. It's very um, risk averse funding atmosphere in Asia, as you might know. So it's kind of that that we had to go through. But I'm happy to say that we have been very, very blessed to raise quite a bit of funding and have the best investors who support us like on a daily basis. And that's exactly what we need. So I think we quickly crossed that hurdle. But I say quickly, but of course, it's a lot of sleepless nights. (laughs) And I was literally doing a rough math and I came up with a number. I've done about 5,000 pitches in the last two years. Literally, of the same thing. Shiok Meats is a cell-based meat company. (laughs) The same thing over and over again. With the same enthusiasm or rather even more enthusiasm and passion. So that's what it is. And I think the third biggest hurdle I would say for us is as a deep tech biotech company, we need access to a lab. And when you're a startup company and when you want to prove a really, really new technology, a hypothesis that you have in your head, you need access to a lab, but you don't have as much money. So you don't have money to build a lab, buy the equipment and so on. Honestly, in Asia, there is no biohacker space or space where you can just rent a table for a month and a bench for a month, use equipment. We literally had nothing and nobody was willing to support us. So we ended up getting our first lab space in an offshore island off of Singapore (laughs) at a marine institute uh, in St. John's Island. So we used to take a boat every morning. (laughs) <laughs> and then go isolate stem cells from shrimp <laughs> and then take the boat in the afternoon to come back. And if you miss the evening boat, you have to stay on the island. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these are literally some things that we had to do. And then quickly we kind of raised some more money to set up our own lab and so on. But yeah, I think it was such a big hurdle at that time. I think between Kai and me, Kai is my, who's my co-founder, we both were like, are we ever going to get lab space to even try our idea? So I think these are the three main kind of hurdles. Yeah. Just the image of you just taking the boat to St. John's Island and back. Wow, that is, I've heard some crazy founder stories, but this one is probably number one. (laughs) I should say I get seasick, so it wasn't the best experience at all. (laughs) This goes to show how much conviction and how much perseverance you just put in. 
Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, it sounds like you, you've really kind of figured out how to kind of cross every obstacle that has presented itself. How did you learn how to do that? Like, did you tap on any support or resources? So I should say this, I never take no for an answer. <laughs> Let it be an investor, a collaborator, an employee or whoever it is. I don't take no for an answer. I don't take no for an answer from my husband or my kid as well. So, but I can say no. <laughs> so yeah, I don't take no for an answer and I have a great skill of negotiation. So I'm a, like a master negotiator. I, it's self-proclaimed, but I am that and I just don't let it go. So I think... Kai also is that person uh, who definitely doesn't let it go very easily. So between the two of us, if we hear a no, we're like, let's just go for it and make it happen. Like we will convert the no to a yes or a maybe at least, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. So everything from, I think just a simple thing, like not having the lab space, right? So we checked every university, every research institute within Singapore. At one point we were considering using some of my contacts in India where I did my undergrad and master's to use their labs. So the plan was to fly over to India, use their lab for a while and then come back to Singapore with the cells and figure things out. Like we thought of everything. So we did all of that. But one thing that we never thought of was move to the US, which a lot of our investors wanted us to do because we wanted to be unique. We wanted to cater to the APAC market, which is where 70% of the world's population lives. So we wanted to stick to our guns about that alone. So that those were some of the things. The next thing was, I was just thinking, I was like, no lab space, what do we do? Do we go to India? Do we spend money to do all of that? How do we think about it? And I remember about four years before that, in 2014 or 15, I met a marine biologist at one of the events, like a conference, and I'd actually interviewed her as part of my blog, Biotech in Asia. And I remembered her. So immediately I dropped her an email saying, hey, how are you? It's been quite a while. Are you still working at the Marine Institute? Do you think we can get some lab access? And she replied within an hour. And she's like, what? Yes, but it's at St. John's Island. <laughs> so it was literally that. And I said, well, sure. How much do you want us to pay? And she said, oh, it's very inexpensive and all of that. And I haven't spoken to her for three years, three and a half years, but I think that spark of a connection and her actually being able to open doors for us was such a big thing. And I just met her a couple of months back and I was like, she couldn't have happened if not for you, literally. And yeah, so just small things between Kai and me, we have a lot of connections. Kai did her undergrad and PhD in the US. I did my undergrad master's in India, PhD in Singapore. Kai has a connection to Australia as well because her husband lives there. So we kind of use our connections and somehow or the other get resources and get things done and so on. Yeah. That's so amazing. What are some common you know, misconceptions that people have about the alternative protein space? Yeah, so I think a couple of things is it is a new industry. It's very novel. The whole industry is less than five years old. So the first time anybody heard that stem cells can be used to make meat was less than five years back. And it was in Europe by a Dutch scientist. But then soon enough, of course, the U.S. jumped on the bandwagon and a couple of companies opened in Southeast Asia and Singapore. We were the first ever company in 2018. So less than two years, around two years ago. I think first misconception that people have is it's like impossible and beyond. That's the first thing. So first thing you go back and tell them, no, this is not plant based. This is not made from soy or pea or plant proteins. It's actually meat. It's biologically, chemically, to the DNA level, it's actual meat, but it doesn't come from a dead animal. The second is, oh, it's GM, it's genetically modified. So we are one of the very few companies that actually don't use any genetic modification and we don't intend to. Not that GM is harmful, actually nobody's ever proven that it is, but GM is expensive. So we don't want to add price to the product. It's a food product, it has to be affordable. So no, not all cell-based meats are GM. Third, I think is, oh, it's grown in the lab. It's franken meat. It's, it's chemical. It's grown in the lab. For me, I, I don't want to say, no, it's not grown in the lab. What I'll counter with is, where do you think your first chocolate, your chocolate drink or your hot chocolate or coffee or tea or whatever it is, where do you think it was first formulated or tested? It was always done in a lab. It's a food lab, right? You'd start off in a lab. 
But eventually what you're eating never comes from a lab. It comes from a food safe manufacturing facility. And that's exactly what cell based meats does. We do the initial research, testing, make sure it's safe, it's clean, it's tasty, all of that in the lab. But eventually it's going to be in a facility that looks like a brewery. But instead of beer, it's meats. That's exactly what it is. So it's a food safe manufacturing facility very similar to every other place where you get your milk from, your cheese from, your <laughs> chocolate drink from, everything. So that's, I think, the third biggest misconception. And these three are what we tend to focus a lot on and get people to understand that the future needs to be thought differently and the way we are eating food and thinking about food needs to be different as well. One thing I've noticed is that you're one of the few parent founders in Southeast Asia. Uh, There's a generation of founders who have ended up becoming parents in the U.S. now. But definitely, Southeast Asia, foundership is relatively new as well. So how do you feel about that? So by parent founders, you mean I'm a parent before I started the company? <laughs> What's it like to have two families, right? The family of your startup, raising another family. Do you have any tips for people who are thinking themselves like, oh, I'm a parent, can I become a founder? Or I'm a founder, am I going to be able to run a business becoming a parent? Any tips or tricks out there? Actually, to tell you the truth, parent founders are the best founders, according to me, because being a parent, you've learned multitasking, you've learned patience, you've learned to hear a lot of no's and a lot of cries. <laughs> so if you've gone through these four things, you can actually be a better founder because you will face all of those four things again when you start a company. So for me, I started Biotech in Asia, my first company, when my son was less than a year old. And I think I was throwing myself down a pit, but <laughs> it made sense at the end of it. Second company, which was Cyglo, which I haven't spoken about. It's an event management company that does science events. I started that in 2016 when my son was about three. Started Shiok Meets when my son was five. One thing that I did do from day one with my son is to make him understand that his mom is a working mother and he's going to see very less of me. But when I'm with him, I, I'm my 100% with him. So I would honestly say if you set expectations right, and if you set the rules to an extent, you set the base to an extent from day one, and make sure your partner is very supportive, like you have a very good support system around you, whether it be your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, your mother, father, helper, whatever it is, make sure you have a very strong support system. And I would say never say no for any help. <laughs> so if someone says, can I take your kid for three hours and play with them? I'm like, take, bye. <laughs> Gives me like three hours of working on things. So for me, it was all that. But with running Biotech in Asia and Cyglo, I was still having a full-time job. So it means it was double the work, but I think my partner was very supportive. My mother was supportive and so on. But one conversation that I did have before starting Shiok was literally this, like, one night I was speaking to my husband. I'm like, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to let it all go. And this is the first time in my life I'm going to borrow money. So I'm going to borrow money from you. You have to, you know, support me at least for the next year. Will you be able to? And it, it was an honest, open conversation. And he said, what? Just go for it. If you fail, it's fine. If you succeed, it's great. So that, and he is a businessman. He's an entrepreneur himself. So I think that push was there. But I also told him that you will be seeing very, very less of me. And you'll have to be seeing a lot more of our child. You'll have to take care of him and so on. And one thing what he told me was what I'll take a step back in my business because my business is already well settled and everything is fine. You need to start off. So I'll take a step back. You put 10 steps ahead and you can go for it. So I think we managed to balance it out. And it's all about open communication at the end of the day. But what being a parent has definitely taught me is multitasking patience and how to handle and juggle multiple things at the same time, but also teach me how to concentrate on certain things at certain point of time. So when I'm with my son, I'm truly with my son and not doing anything else. That's such an amazing set of learnings, honestly. And I agree with you, your partner that you've married, you've committed to be there through thick and thin, right? And that's a big conversation because Startups are really the thin side of life. And then with children, it's a big commitment as well. One thing that comes up a lot has been about diversity and inclusion across tech leadership 
and also founding teams of startups. And so obviously there's been a big push globally for more representation. How do you think about that for yourself and your founding team? So honestly, between Kai and me, we never thought that we will be celebrated as women scientists. And interestingly, we were celebrated with the gender tag to us in the West and not in the East. So in the East, we were celebrated as scientists who became entrepreneurs. But in the West, we are celebrated as women scientists or women entrepreneurs, which is very interesting to us. Um, that's, you know, the, the light that's been thrown upon our achievements are very different in different parts of the world. But we understand where it comes from because everybody's re been reading the news and we know what's happening all, all around the world. Personally, for Kai and me, we haven't faced any in-your-face discrimination or people who have said that, oh, you're female, I won't fund you. You're female, you won't survive and stuff like that. Personally, we haven't, but we have heard enough stories of enough people facing that, that we are in the middle of it. So one thing I would say is in the future, just turned into an angel investor. So I just invested into my first company. Uh, it has a female co-founder in it, but that wasn't the biggest push. Of course, the biggest push was the product itself and the technology, but definitely an added advantage that it had a women co-founder. And in my future, I want to invest more and support companies. And I think my mandate would definitely be that you have at least one woman co-founder. But it shouldn't be like, oh, just because I need money from that fund, I'm going to have a woman co-founder. It shouldn't be that. It should be like, she has to be an important part of the team. And that's how my mandate and my thought process is. Given where we are, I feel one way the world is kind of going towards more inclusivity. But on the other hand, we are completely not even taking into consideration inclusivity at all in certain places. So yes, I think we need to talk about it a lot more, read about it a lot more, listen about it a lot more, and then things will start opening up. We have been funded by some women mandated funds and we are very happy to be part of their portfolio. I think for them, it's about celebrating women and also celebrating Asians as entrepreneurs. I'm from India, Kai is from Singapore, we are Asians. And I think celebrating that also is big for us. And I'm an Indian who left India many, many years ago and moved to Singapore and have been here for more than 12 years. Fitting into everything, fitting into that space, fitting into what is right. I think all of that has taken a while. And I forgot to mention this, but being a parent, you also have selective hearing. So <laughs> sometimes you just listen to what you want to hear <laughs> and negate it out, but not ignoring the fact that you need to talk about it. So, yeah. One last question. If you could go back in time 10 years ago, what advice would you give yourself back then? <laughs> if I Google myself 10 years ago and what advice would I give myself? I would probably say... See, this is what I say now to a lot of potential entrepreneurs. I tell them that go for it, try it. If you don't try it, you'll never know whether you like it. I would have probably told that to me 10 years ago and I've probably started my entrepreneurship journey a little earlier than where I started. That would be my push towards it and probably had a bit more failures <laughs> rather than successes before I kind of went into this full on success mode. Like I mentioned, that personal scary hurdle that I had to go through. If I'd gone through when I was a little younger, that would have been probably better. But, but I'm wiser by age, so it's okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Sandhya. Sure. Thank you for having me. And I really enjoyed this podcast. I think, you know, you ask a lot of personal and growth questions that I'm happy to talk about. And yeah, if anybody needs to reach me, I guess you can link them to my LinkedIn. <laughs>